السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداه أما بعد I'd like to start by welcoming you all to this uh, latest webinar hosted by uh, Islamic Online University. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all those who arranged it and may he make it a source of benefit to all of those in attendance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in uh, Surah Tawbah regarding the months of the year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِتْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمْ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, the months, the number of months with Allah is 12 months. So it was ordained by Allah on the day when He created the heavens and the earth. Of these, four are sacred. That is the correct religion, so do not wrong yourselves therein. Do not wrong yourselves during these four months. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided the year into 12 lunar months. And of these months, four are sacred. Which four are they? In the hadith of uh, Abu Bakr, anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the year consists of 12 months, of which four are sacred. The three consecutive months of Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. So these three months are consecutive. They come one after the other. And then Rajab, which was also known as Mubar, which comes between uh, Jumada and Shaban. So these are the four months. Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. These are the four months that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sacred, made sanctified, uh, as mentioned in the verse in Surah At-Tawbah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen and given special preference to certain days and times that are special and sacred in Islam. Among them is Allah's sacred month of Muharram, which uh, actually started uh, this past Tuesday. So this past Tuesday was the first of uh, Muharram. And so today would be the 5th of Muharram. Today, uh, Saturday, is the 5th of Muharram. So what is special about this month? And what is its significance? What are some of the legislated acts that are to be performed in this month? And what are uh, some of the innovative matters that have been introduced in this month? That is what we will be discussing uh, in this webinar today. And so the first thing that we will go through uh, is the significance of the month of Muharram. Some of the virtues and merits of this great month that have been authentically uh, you know, mentioned uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Firstly, the month of Muharram is one of the sacred months. The month of Muharram is one of the sacred months. And so Muharram literally means sacred. That is the literal uh, meaning of Muharram in the Arabic language. Something that is sacred. Something that is uh, sanctified. And so it was named as such because it is a sacred month and to confirm its sanctity. And what that means is that Muharram, along with the other three sacred months, Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Rajab, are months in which committing sins is worse than committing sins in other months. That is basically the meaning of the, the sacredness or the sanctity of Muharram and the other three months. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us from doing injustice and from wronging ourselves in these months. As Allah mentioned, at the end of the verse that we mentioned, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ So do not wrong yourselves therein. Do not wrong yourselves during uh, the four sacred months. What that means is that we should not commit sins, because sins are greater in these four months. 
And it was reported that Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said that this phrase فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنْفُسَكُمْ uh, referred to all the months. Then these four were singled out and made sacred. So that sin in these months is more serious and good deeds bring a greater reward. And so not only are sins greater in this month and, you know, the other uh, sacred months, but also uh, good deeds are greater. And so there is a greater reward for those who uh, do good deeds in this month and the other sacred months. Imam al-Qurtubi, the famous uh, scholar of tafsir, he said, Allah mentioned the four sacred months in specific and forbade injustice in them as a kind of honor to them, although injustice is forbidden at all times. However, it should be understood that the specific mention of these four months does not imply that no other month is sanctified. This is something important that we should understand. Because some people may ask, uh, how about Ramadan? Ramadan has not been mentioned, and yet uh, Ramadan, uh, you know, is a very great month. And so we should understand that uh, without a doubt, Ramadan is the most sanctified month in the year. Uh, as in this month is the best uh, nights of the year, the last 10 nights. And among those nights, the best night of the year is Laylatul Qadr. And that is all in Ramadan. However, these four months are specifically termed as sanctified months for the simple reason that their, their sacredness was, uh, was accepted even by the Mushrikun of Mecca. And so despite uh, you know, their frequent uh, tribal battles, the Mushrikun observed the sanctity, the sacredness of these four months and considered uh, fighting in these months as being unlawful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upheld the sanctity of these four months in the sharia of his final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the Quran referred to them as al-ashhur al-hurum, the sacred or the sanctified months. Uh, so this was the first, um, you know, merit or virtue of the month of Muharram. Secondly, among the merits or among the virtues of the month of Muharram, is the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam referred to it as Allah's month. When he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best fasting after Ramadan is the month of Allah Muharram. Shahrullah Muharram. And when something is attributed to Allah, when something is attributed to Allah, it indicates its great status, its honor and its virtue. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributed the Kaaba to himself, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bayti. In Surah Al-Hajj, Allah says, وَطَّهِّرْ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْقَائِمِينَ وَالرُّكَّعِ السُّجُودِ And so here Allah refers to the Kaaba and Masjid Al-Haram as his house. Also, when Allah mentioned the she-camel, a naqa that Allah had sent as a sign to the people of Thamud, Allah attributed it to himself and referred to it as naqatullah. And so uh, the reason for that was to um, you know, show the great status and the honor of this uh, she-camel that Allah had sent to the people of Thamud. Some scholars have also mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ attributed the month of Muharram to Allah to make it clear that it is Allah's month. And thus, no one should change this month from being a sacred month to being a non-sacred month. As the Mushrikun of, Mac of Mecca in uh, their Jahiliya, they had switched Muharram with Safar. And they considered Safar uh, sacred instead of Muharram. And so this is the second merit uh, or virtue of the month of Muharram. Uh, thirdly, the month of Muharram is the best month to fast, to fast in after Ramadan. And so the best months for fasting after Ramadan are Muharram and Sha'ban. And it is not encouraged to fast an entire month voluntarily other than these two months. It is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast all of Sha'ban. And as for Muharram, 
then fasting it is better than fasting the rest of the months of the year. Just like praying Qiyam al-Layl in the night is better than praying Nafil in the daytime. The Prophet wasallam said in a hadith that is recorded by a Muslim, the best fasting after Ramadan is that of Muharram, and the best prayer after the obligatory one is the night prayer. So this proves without a doubt that fasting the month of Muharram is uh, the best month to fast in after Ramadan. However, if the best time to fast apart from Ramadan was Muharram, then what about the reports that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast more in the month of Sha'ban, uh, as recorded or as reported by Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentioned that aside from Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ would fast the most in Sha'ban. Imam al nawawi he answered this question when he said, it is likely that the virtue of Muharram was not revealed to him until the end of his life, before he was able to fast during this month. Or perhaps certain things prevented him from fasting much in it, such as travel and sickness. And so this is, uh, you know, the third merit or virtue of the month of Muharram. We move on to the fourth and final merit or virtue that we will mention regarding the month of Muharram, and that is that it consists of the day of Ashura. The month of Muharram consists of the day of Ashura. Imam al Nawawi says, Ashura and Tasu'a are two elongated names, meaning the vowels are elongated as is stated in the books of the Arabic language. Uh, Imam Nawawi goes on to say, our companion said, Ashura is the tenth day of Muharram, and Tasu'a is the ninth day of Muharram. This is our opinion and that of the majority of the scholars. Furthermore, Ashura is an Islamic name that was not known at the time of Jahiliyyah. So it is a name that the Prophet ﷺ gave for the 10th day of Muharram. So the 10th day of Muharram is a very special day. And so the question is, why is Ashura or the 10th of Muharram so special? What are some of the virtues and merits of uh, the 10th of Muharram, the day which is known as Ashura? Well, first of all, the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, is the most sacred day of the month. It is the most special and the most sacred day of the month. And so although Muharram is a sanctified month, a very sacred month as a whole, the 10th day of Muharram is the most sacred of all its days. And this is based on the fact that Ibn Abbas radiallahu an was asked about fasting on the day of Ashura. To which he replied, I do not know of any day in which the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would look forward to giving preference to fasting than this day, the day of Ashura. And this is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. Secondly, the tenth day of Muharram, Ashura, was the day in which Allah had given victory to Musa السلام, and his followers over Fir'aun and his troops. And so it was the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa from the torture and from the oppression and from the injustice of that great tyrant, the greatest tyrant to ever walk on the face of this earth, Fir'aun and his troops, when they followed them and when they tried to cross the sea after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had saved Musa and his followers and Fir'aun and his troops went into the sea thinking that they would be able to follow Musa alayhi salam instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drowned Fir'aun and his troops and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that on that day in which he 
subhanahu wa ta'ala drowned Fir'aun, Allah made his body, the body of Fir'aun, an ayah, a sign that would last forever. A sign for who? A sign for the tyrants, the oppressors, those who are unjust, those who are arrogant, and those who oppress others, that their fate will be the same as the fate of Fir'aun due to his oppression and his injustice. According to Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina, he found that the Jews of Medina used to fast on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura. So he asked them, what is this? They replied, this is a righteous day. In another narration, this is a great day. It is the day when Allah saved Bani Israel, the children of Israel, from their enemies. And so, and so Musa السلام, fasted on this day. And so on hearing this from the Jews, the Prophet وسلم, said, We have more of a right to Musa than you. And so he fasted on that day and he commanded the Muslims to fast uh, as well. And so, uh, when the Prophet وسلم, migrated to Medina and found that the Jews were fasting on this day, uh, he also fasted on this day. Because in the beginning, the Prophet وسلم, used to uh, try to imitate the Jews because they were the people of the book. But towards the end of his life, uh, he used to try to oppose the people of the book. Uh, and that is something that we will come to later on when we mention regarding fasting uh, on this day. And it should also be noted here that um, some of the scholars have mentioned that uh, because the Prophet ﷺ fasted on this day in, in the beginning when he first migrated to Medina and he commanded everyone else to fast, uh, that proves that fasting the day of Muharram was obligatory in the beginning. However, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of fasting the month of Ramadan, uh, the month of Ramadan abrogated, abrogated and cancelled out the obligation of fasting Har. And so we have the month of Ramadan as a replacement for the day of Ashura uh, as a day uh, for fasting. But the point here is that the virtue of the day of Ashura is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam and his followers and gave them victory over Fir'aun and his troops. This should be a lasting reminder to all those Muslims around the world who are being oppressed and you know, uh, being fought against and being killed that they should not they should not lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close at hand just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted victory to Musa alayhi salam over that tyrant Fir'aun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant victory to all those Muslims who are facing similar to what Musa alayhi salam and his followers faced at the hands of Fir'aun and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant, grant victory to the Muslims around the world who are being oppressed and who are in need of Allah's help and his aid and his victory. Ameen. Thirdly, fasting the day of Ashura is an expiation of a year of sins. And so fasting the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, basically erases the sins of an entire year. And this is based on the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, I hope that by fasting the day of Arafah, Allah will expiate thereby the sins of the year before it and the sins of the year after it. So Arafah, the fasting the day of Arafah, is an expiation of the sins of two years. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, And by fasting the day of Ashura, I hope Allah will expiate thereby the sins of the year that came before it. And this hadith is recorded by Muslim. Uh, 
And so, as we can see, uh, fasting on this day uh, is virtuous. And uh, the one who fasts on this day, it is hoped that the sins of the year that has passed by will be forgiven. And so this is from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala toward us. For fasting one day, he gives us expiation for the sins of an entire year. And so the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his blessing and his mercy towards his slaves is unlimited. And so these are some of the virtues and merits that have been authentically mentioned regarding the month of Muharram and the best day in it, Ashura. Other than that, there are some legends and misconceptions with regards to Ashura that have managed to find their way into the minds of many Muslims, which have absolutely no support from authentic Islamic sources. Some very common misconceptions among them include the idea that it is the day in which Adam alayhi salam, Ashura is the day in which Adam alayhi salam was created, or that it is the day when Ibrahim alayhi salam was born, or that it is the day when Allah accepted the repentance of Adam alayhi salam, or that it is the day uh, in which uh, Yawm al-Qiyamah will take place, or that whoever takes a, uh, a bath on the day of Ashura will never get ill. So all of these um, legends and misconceptions are totally baseless and have uh, no basis in the Sharia. Ah. They have absolutely no proof uh, from any authentic sources. So that is regarding the virtues, the merits of the month of Muharram and uh, especially the day of Ashura. We now move on to uh, what is legislated for this great month, the month of Muharram. Meaning, what are some of the things that we can do in this month of Muharram? And before we mention them, uh, I'd like to mention a very, very important point. And that is that no act of worship, however great it may be, uh, no act of worship is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without fulfilling two great conditions. The first condition is that it must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if you do something for other than Allah's sake, then that act of worship will not be accepted from you. The second condition is that the act of worship should be done in accordance with how Allah has legislated, meaning it should be done in accordance to how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us. So if you pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, if you pray to Allah sincerely, you have fulfilled the first condition. But if you do not pray according to the Sunnah, according to how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, then you have not fulfilled the second condition, and so your act of worship is not accepted. So any act of worship, if we want it to be accepted by Allah, it should be done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it should be done in accordance with how Allah and his messenger have legislated. And so the first uh, thing that we can mention here is that fasting the month of Muharram and especially the day of Ashura is without a doubt among those things which have been legislated in the month of Muharram. As we've mentioned so far, it is highly encouraged to fast as much as one can in this month of Muharram. And that is due to the hadith which we mentioned earlier, where the Prophet ﷺ said, the best fasting after Ramadan is that of Muharram, and the best prayer after the obligatory prayer is the night prayer. So this uh, proves without a doubt that fasting the month of Muharram is highly encouraged. It is among those things that are legislated uh, authentically for the month of Muharram. And so a Muslim should take advantage of such opportunities, especially when we are now, uh, you know, uh, living uh, in these days which are shorter and not as hot as, and difficult as, uh, you know, the days 
of the summer. However, if you cannot fast for most of the month, if you cannot fast for most of the month, you should at least seek to fast those days which are sunnah to fast throughout the year. So that you get an additional reward for fasting those specific days. Such as Mondays and Thursdays. It is sunnah and virtuous and rewarding to fast Mondays and Thursdays. So if you cannot fast um, the entire month of Muharram, then you should at least fast Mondays and Thursdays during this month. Also, the three middle days of the month. The three middle days of the month, which are known as Ayyam al -Bib. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged fasting on these three middle days. They are basically the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of every month. Uh, which basically this year, uh, this month of Muharram, it will basically be next Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So not tomorrow, but next week, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday uh, are the three middle days uh, of the month of Muharram. As for fasting Ashura, then as we have already mentioned, it was preferred by the Prophet ﷺ more than any other day of the year. So it is something that a Muslim should definitely not miss out on. He should definitely not miss out on fasting uh, the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. However, uh, the question is, when is Ashura? And how should it be fasted? Firstly, uh, Ashura this year will be on Thursday. As I mentioned, uh, today is the 5th of Muharram. So that would make Thursday uh, the 14th of November, uh, the 10th of Muharram. So this coming Thursday is the 10th of Muharram, uh, the day of Ashura. Um, the second question, how should it be fasted? How should we fast uh, the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura? It is recommended that if you fast Ashura, that you also fast Tasu'a. We mentioned that Tasu'a is basically the 9th of Muharram. Uh, and this is based on the hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, who said that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted on Ashura and he commanded the Muslims to fast as well, they said, the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, it is a day that is venerated, it is glorified by the Jews and Christians. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if I live to see next year, inshaAllah we will fast on the ninth day too. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he said that if I live to see next year, that insha'Allah we will also fast on the night. But it so happened that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away before next year came. This hadith is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. And so the scholars have mentioned that one should fast both the 9th and the 10th of Muharram due to this hadith. And so Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad and others have stated that it is mustahab, highly recommended to fast both the 9th and the 10th because the Prophet ﷺ fasted the 10th and he had intended to fast on the 9th. What is the wisdom behind adding the 9th day to fasting along with the 10th? Imam al nawawi stated, that the scholars mentioned several reasons why it is mustahab recommended to fast on Tasu'a, the ninth of Muharram. The first is that the intention behind it is to be different from the Jews who only venerate the tenth day. And this opinion was reported by Ibn Abbas. The second is that the intention is to add another day's fast to Ashura, to add another day to the 10th. Uh, and this is similar to the, uh, to the prohibition of fasting a day, to fasting Friday on its own. And so we are not allowed to fast uh, Friday on its own. 
we must add another day if we're going to fast on Friday. So if you fast on Friday, you should also fast Thursday or Saturday. So similarly, the scholars said that perhaps the wisdom here is to add another day to Ashura because we should not fast just one day. And the third reason that Imam Anawi mentions, he said to be safe or, or to be on the safe side and make sure that one fasts on the 10th. To make sure that he has fasted on the 10th, he should add the 9th in case there is some error in the sighting of the moon at the beginning of Muharram and the ninth ends up being in fact the tenth. So if you fast on both days, the, the ninth and the tenth, there is no doubt that you have fasted uh, the tenth, which is the day uh, if you fast, you will be uh, forgiven your sins for an entire year. However, the strongest of these reasons is the first. That being, uh, you know, the, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to be different from the people of the book, from Ahlul Kitab. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah actually uh, cited this as one of the examples, uh, one of the many examples where the Prophet ﷺ purposely chose to go contrary to the Jews and Christians for fear of imitating them. And so Ibn Taymiyyah said, The Prophet ﷺ forbade imitating Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, in many a hadith. For example, his words concerning Ashura, that if I live until the next year, I will certainly fast on the ninth day. Uh, however, is it wrong to only fast on Ashura? Is it wrong to only fast on the 10th of Muharram? The answer is no. There is nothing wrong with that. If somebody cannot fast on the 9th, uh, and he only wants to fast on the 10th, there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said, uh, fasting on the day of Ashura is an expiation for a year, and it is not makruh. It is not disliked to fast only on that day. How about fasting the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th? How about fasting three days? Some scholars are of the opinion that it is best to fast the Ashura along with the day before it and the day after it, so that one is 100% sure that he has fasted Ashura. And this is narrated from Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anh, that he used to fast uh, all three days when traveling, so that he would not miss it. Uh, and it is reported from several of the Tabi'un. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said that the grades of fasting Ashura are three, or the levels of fasting Ashura are three, the best of which is to fast a day before it and a day after it. The second is to fast the ninth uh, along with the tenth, and the last is to fast the tenth day alone. So this is what Ibn Qayyim mentioned. However, many other scholars favor the best being fasting the ninth and the tenth. And that is because that was the last wish of the Prophet ﷺ before he passed away. But at any rate, uh, if somebody only fasts on the tenth, there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody fasts on the ninth and the tenth, there's nothing wrong with that. And if somebody wants to fast the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh, then there is nothing wrong with that. As we mentioned earlier, that fasting Muharram, the entire month voluntarily, is, uh, you know, rewarding for the one who does so. And so this is the first uh, of those things that are legislated for the month of Muharram, and especially the 10th day, the day of Ashura, that of fasting. We move on to the second point. Secondly, performing as many variety of good deeds as one can. And so, what we can say regarding the month of Muharram, that there is only one act of worship that has been legislated for the month of Muharram, and that is fasting. Meaning that that is the only thing that has been specified and mentioned in the uh, Sunnah, that is mentioned in the Sunnah, to fast. However, 
If one performs other deeds in this month, will he be rewarded? Of course he will be rewarded. And that is because, as we mentioned earlier, the month of Muharram is one of the four sacred months. What that means is that sin in these months is multiplied and is great. And, uh, and so, just like sin is great, uh, performing good deeds is also great and multiplied in its reward. And so a person should do as many good deeds as he can during this month of Muharram. Of course he should fast, there's no doubt about fasting, but he should also do many other good deeds, as many as he can, without specifying a certain uh, you know, act of worship for a certain time. And so, you know, if somebody wants to pray Qiyam al-Layl and Tahajjud, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody wants to give Sadaqah, uh, he will be rewarded greatly uh, in this month of Muharram. And that is because, like we mentioned, the good deeds are multiplied uh, during this month, uh, just like the sins are uh, multiplied. And now we move on to the third and final uh, point that we can mention regarding uh, that which is uh, legislated uh, in the month of Muharram, and that is refraining from sins and protecting oneself from them. Refraining from sins and protecting oneself from sins. And that is because, like we mentioned, uh, Muharram is one of the four sacred months. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ And do not wrong yourselves therein. What that means is that we should not do injustice to our souls, to our nufus. We should not do injustice to ourselves. How? By committing sins. By committing sins. Because committing sins are multiplied in the month of Muharram and all the other months, uh, all the other uh, months that have been mentioned regarding uh, the, the sacred and sanctified months. And so one should try his best to stay away from sins and especially those sins that one uh, has become accustomed to especially those sins that one has become accustomed to there is no better time than these times the month of Muharram uh, the other sacred months the month of Ramadan these are times when we should take advantage of to change ourselves and to refrain from committing those sins that we have become accustomed to and have become part of our lives. Now we move on to uh, some of the uh, reprehensible innovations related to the month of Muharram. By reprehensible innovations, we mean uh, bid'ahs. And so a bid'ah is basically the definition of a bid'ah is every statement, action, or abandonment that the slave worships Allah through while there is nothing in the religion that proves its legislation. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in uh, Surah Al-Shura, أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَاءُ شَرَعُوا لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْذَنْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Or have they partners with Allah? who have ordained for them a religion to which Allah has not consented. And so those who commit bid'ahs, who commit innovations in the religion, they are in fact claiming that, you know, uh, that they are legislating things, and so they are partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they are basically legislating that which Allah has not consented. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us from innovations in the religion when he said in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that he who innovates something in this matter of ours, meaning in Islam, which is not of it, he will have it rejected. And this hadith is reported by Bukhari and Muslim. And so there are many bid'ahs related to the month of Muharram that the people have innovated throughout time. Some are old and some are new. But at any rate, they are all those things which have not been legislated by the Sharia. 
meaning that there is nothing in the Quran and the Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah, to prove to prove that these things have any concern with the month of Muharram. And so we'll we'll mention a few of them. The first is uh, celebrating the first of Muharram as a New Year's Day. As a New Year's Day. And this is something new that did not exist in the past. And so many ignorant Muslims, they started to imitate the Christians and the Kuffar who basically celebrate uh, the 1st of January as a New Year's Day celebration. And they have, you know, all types of festi festivities and celebrations on that day. Many ignorant Muslims have fallen into this, and they said that, well, we also have a, you know, calendar, the Islamic calendar, the Hijri calendar, which actually begins on the 1st of Muharram. So why do we not also celebrate the 1st uh, day as a New Year's Day? However, there is no specific Islamic ruling that has been authentically reported regarding the end of the year or its beginning. Not sayings, nor actions, nor any virtues. In fact, uh, the Islamic New Year, or the Hijri New Year, and the Hijri calendar, the Islamic calendar, did not even exist in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, it was something that uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab he basically uh, invented, he invented, the new, uh, he invented the Islamic calendar. And that is not um, uh, considered as a bid'ah because he did not take it as an act of worship. He did not take it as an act of worship. And so the purpose of uh, putting together an Islamic calendar that was based on the hijrah, the migration of the Prophet ﷺ, the only purpose behind it was to basically organize the Islamic State. And so it was uh, something that Umar ﷺ had introduced. And so uh, there's nothing uh, authentically established regarding celebrating uh, the first of Muharram or of there being any virtue regarding the first of Muharram. Uh, we move on to um, uh, the second point here that we can mention and that is those who have taken Ashura, the tenth of Muharram, as a day of celebration and a joyous occasion. And so one group went to the extreme and imitated the Jews concerning Ashura. And Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said regarding them, he says, as for the other things such as cooking special dishes, uh, wearing new clothes, or spending money on one's family, or buying the year's supplies on that day, meaning the 10th of Muharram, or doing special acts of worship, such as special prayers, or deliberately slaughtering an animal on that day, or saving some of the meat of the sacrifice to cook with grains, or wearing kuhl, wearing henna, or taking uh, a bath, performing ghusl, or shaking hands with one another, or visiting one another, or visiting certain masajid and shrines, and so on. Ibn Taymiyyah says, all of this is reprehensible bid'ah. It is evil bid'ah and it is wrong. None of it has anything to do with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, or the way of the Khulafa al Rashidun. It was not approved by any of the Imams of the Muslims, not Malik, nor Al Thawri, nor Layth ibn Sa'd, nor Abu Hanifa, nor Al Awza'i, nor Al Shafi'i, nor Ahmed ibn Hanbal, nor Ishaq ibn Rahawiyya, nor any of the Imams and scholars of the Muslims. And so, there's no doubt that specifying the day of Ashura as a day of, uh, of celebration and a joyous occasion and an Eid uh, is without a doubt a bid'ah and has absolutely no basis uh, in Islam. And it is actually uh, something 
that was introduced by a sect or a group known as the Nawasib. The Nawasib uh, are basically those who, uh, you know, opposed the Shia, are those who opposed the Shia. And, and they went to the other extreme of the Shia. And so you have the Shia, the Rafiba, who went uh, into the extreme of loving Ali radiallahu an and the family of Ali, and you had the Nawasib, the Nawasib who went to the other extreme of hating Ali and the family of Ali. So the Nawasib are the ones who considered Ashura as a day of celebration, a joyous occasion. Why? Because it was the day in which uh, the son of Ali was killed, and that was Al Hussein. And we will get into that um, in the next point. Uh, right now, we even Allah Taala. Uh, and this is the final point that we will mention, uh, and that is uh, the bid'ah of taking Ashura as a day of mourning and wailing, considering the day of Ashura as a sad day, a day in which you should mourn, you should be sad, you should cry, you should wail. And so the other group went to the other extreme, considering Ashura a day of mourning and wailing. And that is due to the death of Al Hussein, the son of Ali, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was martyred on that day, on the tenth of Muharram. And this event is marked by the Shia, the Rafida, who refer to it as Karbala, as that was the place where Al Hussein uh, ibn Ali was killed. Ibn Kathir. The famous uh, scholar Ibn Kathir, he said, Every Muslim should mourn the killing of Hussein, for he is one of the leaders of the Muslims, one of the scholars of the Sahaba, and the son of the daughter of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who was the best of his daughters. He was a devoted worshipper. He was a courageous and generous man. He went on to say, but there is nothing good in what the Shia do of expressing distress and grief, most of which may be done in order to show off. His father was better than him, and yet he was killed. But they do not take his death as an anniversary as they do with the death of Hussein. Uthman radiallahu anhu was better than Ali, according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and he was killed when he was besieged in his house. But the people did not take his death as an anniversary. Umar ibn al-Khattab was better than Ali and Uthman, and he was killed while he was standing in his mihrab, praying Salat al-Fajr and reciting the Qur'an, but the people did not take his death as an anniversary. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was better than them all, but the people did not take his death as an anniversary. Ibn Kathir, he goes on to say, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is the leader of the sons of Adam in this world and the hereafter, and Allah took him, uh, Allah took him uh, to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the prophets died before him, but no one took the dates of their deaths as anniversaries on which they do uh, what these ignorant rafibis do on the day that Hussein was killed. Uh, so this is the quote of Ibn Kathir. For those who are not familiar with the term of uh, Rafidis, uh, it is another term used to describe the Shia. And that is because um, basically one of their Imams, Zayd ibn Ali, uh, when they came to him and uh, wanted him to curse Abu Bakr and Umar, he refused. He refused. So the Shia rejected him. They rejected him. And so, from that day onwards, they were known as the Rafidah, which means the rejectors. So, uh, when you hear the term Rafidis, they are basically the Shia. And Ibn Taymiyyah says, regarding uh, the Shia, who, who basically uh, take uh, this day of Ashura as a day of mourning, Ibn Taymiyyah says, an ignorant, wrongful group, who are either heretics and hypocrites, or misguided and misled, made a show of allegiance to Hussein and the members of his household. 
So they took the day of Ashura as a day of mourning and wailing, in which they openly displayed the rituals of Jahiliyyah, such as slapping their cheeks and rending their garments, grieving in the manner of the Jahiliyyah. The shaitan made this attractive to those who are misled. So they took the day of Ashura as an occasion of mourning, when they grieve and wail, reciting poems of grief and telling stories filled with lies. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, Whatever truth there may be in these stories serves no purpose other than the renewal of their grief and sectarian feeling and the stirring up of hatred and hostility among the Muslims, which they do by cursing those who came before them. Ibn Taymiyyah here is referring to the Shia cursing the Sahaba. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, Some others, either the Nawasib, the Nasibis, or um, others who oppose and have enmity towards Hussein and his family, or ignorant people who try to fight evil with evil, corruption with corruption, lies with lies, and bid'ah with bid'ah, they opposed them, meaning the Nawasib opposed the Shia, by fabricating reports in favor of making the day of Ashura a day of celebration, by wearing kuhl and henna, uh, spending money on one's children, cooking special dishes, and other things that are done on Eid and special occasions. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, these people took the day of Ashura as a festival like Eid, whereas the others took it as a day of mourning. Both are wrong, and both go, ag uh, and both go against the Sunnah, even though the other group, those who take it as a day of mourning, are worse in intention and more ignorant and more plainly wrong. And so as we can see, there is no doubt that uh, what these Shia do on the day of Ashura is, is clear misguidance. And what further emphasizes that is that all the scholars of Islam are unanimous on the point that mourning of this type is impermissible. In fact, even Hussein radiallahu an, shortly before his death, he had advised his sister Zainab not to mourn his death in this manner. And so he said, my dear sister, I swear upon you that in case I die, you shall not tear your clothes, nor scratch your face, nor curse anyone for me, or pray for your death. And thus we can see that what the Shia, the Rafidah, do on the occasion of Ashura is clear misguidance that is far from the true authentic teachings of Islam. In fact, uh, one final point that I will conclude with is that the killing of Hussein radiallahu an was actually as a result of the Shia themselves, something that not many people are aware of. And that is because the Shia trace back their origins to the, to the people of Kufa, to the people of Iraq. And Hussein radiallahu an, uh, after the death of his brother al Hassan, uh, Muawiyah continued uh, as the Khalifa of the Muslims. And uh, before Muawiyah passed away, he gave the Khilafah to his son Yazid, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. So uh, the people of Iraq did not like that. And they wrote letters to Hussein, who was in Medina and told him that we give you pledge of allegiance, we want you to come to Iraq so that we can revolt against Yazid who does not deserve to be the Khalifa. And so they wrote him letters after letters after letters until he was deceived by them. And even though the companions in Medina warned him not to go and become deceived by the people of Iraq, al Hussein radiallahu an became deceived by them and set out with his family members and went to Iraq where Yazid had sent uh, an army to prevent him from revolting against him. And so it was, uh, you know, on the 10th of Muharram that uh, Al-Husayn radiallahu an was killed. And uh, the point here is that the people of Kufa who had given allegiance to, uh, to al Hussein to help him in his revolt against Yazid, they did not come out to help him. And so the point is that the Shia who trace their roots back to the people of Kufa, they are the ones 
who are responsible for the death of Al Hussein, the son of Ali, radiyallahu anhum, and on the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And with that, we come to the end of this webinar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to grant us all beneficial knowledge, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, to make us to take advantage and benefit from this month of Muharram. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to allow us to fast on the day of Ashura, and we ask Him subhanahu wa taala to make it a means of having our sins erased and expiated. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته